the dynamics of our problem. And because of this structure that we recover here, we get new information about localization of resonance states, so analogs of eigen functions. Okay. Now, uh, let me quick. These are actually, so the size of the stress, they are given by natural dynamical quantities. Once I state the dynamical assumptions, these are the minimal and maximal expansion rates or Lyapunov of exponents in the direction transversal to the trapped set. So there is, yes, so there is, a, a, those are very reasonable objects. So the motivating example is uh, this, let's take a slowly rotating or I keep forgetting to remove, I can remove the word slowly now since a week ago. Uh, you take a rotating black hole in a spacetime with a positive cosmological constant. That's a Lorentz and manifold. It's drawn on the right, basically. You have some angular directions, two sphere, which I didn't draw. They're not very interesting. Then you have the time direction, which goes vertical. And then you have the radial direction. And your metric is just wedged between these two fixed radii. And the surfaces R equals R plus and R minus are called the event horizons. And their property with respect to the metric is that the light cones are tangent to the event horizon. So if you go out of the event horizon, you never come back. So this kind of causal structure makes it possible to just study the initial value problem for the wave equation in between the two event horizons because you don't have any information coming from inside the black hole. And you see that these event horizons provide a way for energy to escape. So the question, the natural question is how fast does a solution to the linear wave equation decay as time goes to infinity? Okay. No. Well, so th there are explicit formulas for the metric, which I spared you. There, yeah, they would they occupy. Well, so the metric is stationary. And then the simplest model that you could think about is, I'm just going to draw you the light cones. So if you had no angular directions, then if I had r minus and r plus, here I would have a light cone like this, like that. And then your light cones, as you are near the center, they just. So if you are far away from the black hole or the cosmological horizon, then the metric just looks like dt square minus dr square, you know, plus radial terms and so on. So just the usual Minkowski metric. And as you approach the event horizons, the structure skews, so it becomes more like dt times dr. So if I had a cone that looked like that, that would correspond to that metric. So the, the exact formulas they, on the horizons, they establish this behavior. Inside the physical region, they look more like you would expect the Minkowski space to look. And then the global dynamics we will study in detail, and I will explain what's the global dynamics of so trapping for this escape. situation. Well, you would have nowhere to escape, in a way. So then I would only have eigenvalues. Yes. And then, and then because I have an escape mechanism, yes. I, I those, those eigenvalues can become resonance. Yes. So, well, you will have no eigenvalues in this situation. No, I know, but they're, so they're, they're you, you will only have resonance. In, in yes. So in fact, most of the things will escape. As we'll see, there will be a dynamical description of what happens. OK. So there's a two-year-old two result that if you have a slowly rotating black hole, at least, you know, this specific black hole given by the specific formulas that I didn't write, then the solutions to the wave equation actually decay exponentially. Well, modula, there is a constant solution, but let's, you know, you can take it out. Everything else decays exponentially in time. And you can actually quantify this exponential decay so you can find an asymptotic expansion of the solution of the wave equation as time goes to infinity, by which I mean the following. So here's my set of resonances. Looks something like that, let's say. Then you give me some arbitrary constant nu, and I can write my solution as sum over resonances above this threshold, so above this decay rate, plus O large V to the minus nu t. So that's not the same as for the wave equation. That's not a this is a converging series, but this is an as asymptotic expansion as time goes to infinity because you, know, you, you can only take nu to be something what's big but fixed. The, what's the role of the 
Well, uh, it turns out it took people some time to uh, make this precise, but it, it turns out that as long as the black hole is uh, sub-extremal, it's not rotating uh, faster than the speed of light in a way. Uh, the role is, the statement remains the same, essentially. But you get additional technical difficulties, most of which I will not consider here because they have to do with things that are not trapping. That's how people started, yeah. But it turns out that the dynamical structure is independent of whether you're rotating or not. So it just, it's a, it's a bit more of a pain to write it out, but it turns out that from a point of view of trapping, and that's the phenomenon driving our statements, uh, the, the dynamical structure of the trapping is actually the same. I'll, 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 I'll reach it in a moment. Well, you can kind of think, you know, you can, you, you can fall here, you can fall there, so there, there, there must be some point in between where, where you don't fall either way. But I, 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 I will draw what the trapping looks like. Uh, okay. And moreover, actually, we know where resonances lie. Up to any negative power of the real part, if you take a fixed size strip, you can actually approximate your resonances by a quantization condition which I also don't write out here because this talk is not about quantization conditions, it's about escaping the quantization condition if you want. But uh, here's a nice uh, physical comparison. Well, so the red dots are the exact resonances or also known as quasi-normal modes computed by some physicists. Uh, exact, uh, unfortunately I mean numerical because uh, gravitational waves which you know, would be the underlying physical phenomenon so far haven't been uh, really observed on Earth. Uh, and then this picture might be somewhat confusing, but what happens is if A is equal to zero, so if the black hole is not rotating at all, you get something that looks like a distorted lattice. That's really what a quantization condition means in this case. And as you go farther, your lattice, you know, your approximation of this lattice gets better and better. Now, if I dial my A, so this picture's uh, resonance is for several black holes with different values of rotation parameter, and there should be more stuff here but it's uh, slightly harder to compute, so I didn't display it. <laughs> then you can see that the modes corresponding to different uh, angular momentum will split in a Zeeman-like effect. And so that's what this picture represents. Okay, and then the blue is uh, order two, I think, a semi-classical approximation, but this quantization condition, then you see as you go to the right, so as you go towards infinity in the real part, your quantization condition really approximates better and better the quasi-normal modes. Okay, so there is a good amount of previous work done for this particular problem. Uh, so for the non-rotating case, so people started with that, for the Schwarzschild de Sitter case, there is work of Sabaretta Zworski, Bonnie Hafner, the Fermas Radyansky, Melrose Sabaretta Vashi, establishing more and more pieces of this picture and the resonance expansion. And then for the rotating case, Parts of this picture uh, can be recovered from Wunsch, Zworski, and Vashi in 2010. Plus there is numerous research for zero cosmological constant where you have uh, the unique challenge there comes from having an asymptotical Euclidean infinity and somehow is not relevant to what we study in this particular talk. So I will so skip this. Constant, any of your well, actually not much. We don't really use that it solves the Einstein equations, the metric. But what it does is if you have a zero cosmological constant, instead of having a cosmological horizon here, you'll have something like infinity of a Minkowski space. Except it's not exactly the Minkowski space, it has some polynomial in our perturbations, and it turns out that if you propagate your linear waves, they tend to concentrate at low frequencies and shadow back on you, and you will not get exponential decay. So it's a very different phenomenon, not coming from trapping, not coming from high frequency, also very hard to study, but somewhat decoupled from what I'm I'm talking about. That's why I didn't uh, include it here. Okay. So now the natural question is, well, why? So we have this picture, uh, these resonances, we have resonance expansion, we have this nice structure of resonances, but why does this happen? As I said, most of the time when you look at resonances, you, you just see a huge mess. Well, for this specific original situation, what happened is 
we were able to do a resonance expansion because we knew where resonances lie, because this is a non self adjoint spectral problem. In order to have some good approximation of the result, you actually need to know where resonances are. And that would, this quantization condition in turn always relies on complete integrability of the underlying system, which we do have in this specific case. The specific progesterone matter has completely integrable geodesic flow. Now we want to somehow move away from the symmetry, so what we do is we perturb our metric in a stationary and ask what kind of properties are going to stay. Okay. Well, so we have to change our strategy. So we will start instead of as assuming symmetries or you know, precise formulas for a metric, we will make dynamical assumptions that will be stable under perturbation. So that's our normal hyperbolicity. Then we will use this to deduce some facts about long time behavior of waves. And from there, we will be able to still recover this band structure of resonances without being able to handle individual resonances. After all, even for a compact manifold, you cannot handle individual eigenvalues with high precision. You can only handle them in bulk. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. So now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to forget about black holes because uh, well, this structure is very interesting. <laughs> So this structure is pretty interesting and there are a lot of challenges there, but somehow they have been handled in this situation, they have been handled already by, in this particular situation, by Vashi. So what we're going to do, since we are only interested in the set of trapped geodesics, which is far away from the black hole event horizons, we're going to, for the purpose of this discussion, we're going to look at a simpler model. You just have a product metric. And you have a manifold, which is R3 outside of a compact set, just a Riemannian manifold times the time direction. So it's something that's easy to uh, explain, easier to explain. And then what are resonances? Well, this is kind of a spectral problem, but not exactly. So what you do is you first start in the so-called physical half plane, and there you have your resolvent of the Laplacian. So here my Laplacian is a non-negative definite operator, minus some dhg squared. And this resolvent just the usual spectral resolvent, but the non-trivial fact is that you can actually continue this resolvent meromorphically to the lower half plane and through the continuous spectrum. So here you would have the continuous spectrum of the Laplacian. And if you are just looking at the Schwartz kernel of this thing, or if you're willing to uh, consider as an operator acting from compactly supported to local L2 functions, then you can actually meromorphically continue this thing to the lower half plane. It will have poles. They're is uniquely M defined. Why is your M compact or not? M is not compact. So M is something Euclidean. that's the Euclidean space. So what used to be event horizons now is Euclidean infinity. Yeah. Yes. So here, so this this setup, as I said before, the actual structure of infinity for the purpose of this talk is not very relevant, so I use the simplest, the classical structure of scattering metric scattering. You can think of it as a metric it's perturbation. Yes, well, boundaries are hard, so I don't have any boundary. I just have something that looked like R3, and then I take a metric and I modify my metric inside. Yeah, it's 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 the, it's the simplest thing to set up, and actually for black hole there are no. Yes, yeah, so that this compact region is where the trapping will occur. Yes, it would just be more technically harder to handle because of the boundary. Yeah. Uh, It's, uh, yes, but what we do is we, uh, we, we want to apply to metric problems anyway, and there are lots of things, like hyperbolic quotients is also a metric problem. So okay. it's, uh, this is quite a standard with lots of other things. Uh, compact perturbation metrics, the symmetry is metric. Yeah. Yeah. So, now we are going to study long living resonances. So those are just resonances which are in a fixed distance away from the real line because if we actually had some kind of observations, those would be the ones that we can detect. Everything else would decay exponentially much faster. And uh, 
Also, those are the resonances whose structure uh, somehow highlights the dynamical properties of our situation that we really want to look at. So these, the behavior of these resonances depends on the so-called trapped set, which I will draw schematically here. So what we do is we just consider geodesics on this Riemannian manifold that do not escape in either time direction. So this just stay in a fixed compact set, obviously in the set where the metric perturbation was. So uh, schematically, I will draw what happens like that. So imagine a good model of the trapping that we will get is a man standing on a hill in, in 1D. So we just take Hamiltonian, which is psi square plus V of X, and that's V. Okay. So there you would have a trapped set. This is X and this is psi. You have just you know, man standing doing nothing. Then you would have a lot of escaping trajectories. This is rolling back from the hill. This is rolling over the hill. And then you would have these things that are also important for us, incoming and outgoing tails, which correspond to, well, the incoming tails, it corresponds to a situation where you barely don't have enough energy to roll onto. So these are geodesics that only escape in one time direction. Or I should say that are trapped in one time direction. Technically, it includes the trapped set. Okay, <coughs> so what's the dynamical structure of the trapping that we're going to assume? So, well, I should really say, uh, I, I should first answer the question, so what happened for, the say, the schwarzschild de Sitter metric? Well, what happens is, so this event horizon, th this, is, this is irrelevant, this event horizon is, say, r equals 2m, and if you take r equals 3m here, so-called photon sphere, if you take a light ray that's tangent to the photon sphere, then it will stay tangent to it forever. So what you will get, you will get a situation like this where this is the cotangent bundle to the photon sphere. So I should say that I consider my geodesic flow in the cotangent bundle of the manifold because from point of macro-local analysis, that's what one should do. And then you would have these rays that will exponentially approach the photon sphere and will wind around it in some way. These will be these incoming outgoing tails. And then I formulate these assumptions. So I assume, so this, this first assumption already kills the possibility of applying it to anything interesting hyperbolic because I need to assume that my incoming outgoing tails are smooth. I should say, you know, in many other very interesting situations, these things are fractal. They, they don't even have an integer Hausdorff dimension. But in my particular situation, they are, and that recovers some interesting structure. Then. I assume that the trapped set is their transversal intersection. It's a symplectic submanifold of the cotangent bundle. And then normal hyperbolicity means what? Well, imagine I'm imagine I am on gamma plus, for example. So mathematically speaking, these hyperbolicity assumptions talk about the linearization, the differential of the geodesic flow on the trapped set for long times. So the way you could picture it, for example, if I'm on gamma plus, and this is my trapped set K, so the flow is, of course, tangent to the trapped set. And then you would expect the flow to look like this. So this is the geodesic flow. So as you go backwards, you converge to the trapped set, and I require that you converge exponentially fast. Again, from a technical point of view, you should formulate a statement about linearization differential, but it's uh, nicer to draw this way. And then I define new min and new max. These are just the minimal and maximal rates of exponential convergence, eventual exponential convergence, because of course the trapped set is big and from point to point you can have different uh, convergence rates. Then another important quantity that I'm going to define is the maximal Lyapunov exponent, or the maximal, if you want, eventual Lipschitz constant in the exponential of the geodesic flow along the trapped set, because even though I draw it here as a point, remember it's, it's a huge manifold, dimension two, so there could be expansion happening along this manifold. And then what I'm going to assume is this R normal hyperbolicity, namely that the rate of expansion in the transversal directions is much, much bigger than the rate of expansion along the trapped set. And finally, I'm going to assume this pinching condition. It's not needed for a bulk of the construction, but if you don't have a pinching condition and you would have two bands of resonances, then the first band would overlap the second band, uh, so you couldn't really count. 
Okay. <laughs> now, <coughs> it turns out that this particular set of assumptions as a whole is stable under small smooth perturbations of your dynamical system, or your metric or your Hamiltonian. That's, uh, that's not a trivial fact at all, but luckily it was proved already by Hirsch, Pugh, and Shubin 77. Uh, and I should note that this R normal hyperbolicity is uh, pivotal in actually making this work because if you take a hyperbolic quotient, you can start with a 3D Fuchsian quotient, you perturb it a tiny bit, you get something that's, fr that's completely fractal. That doesn't satisfy these smoothness assumptions. Then this is true for, again, I shouldn't say slowly, it's true for pretty much any Kerr de Sitter black hole. And for Schwarzschild de Sitter already described what this thing looks like, it's just the photon sphere and the responding incoming outgoing tails. And finally, I should say that this structure of trapping is actually not that rare. So it appears uh, in some uh, works on quantum chemistry, and maybe more relevantly, it appears for a study of decay of correlations for real resonances. So for resonances for ANOSA flows on compact manifolds. So even though the problem there, I don't have time, unfortunately, to talk about how this works technically, even though the study of decay of correlations or rate of mixing for chaotic flows uh, looks like a very different problem. You don't have the wave operator, you have the, you know, your transfer operator, your generator of the flow. It turns out that the trapping structure is very similar. And the uh, K would be given by the null section, actually, in the, uh, in, in the corresponding uh, potential bundle. Yes. Uh, well, that's not exactly what happens in this application. Yeah, so it's, uh, it, it would, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, if you, if, if you put it in the correct framework, the, you know, the, the, the trapping looks the same, but it takes some, some time to actually, that's why it was only done recently, it takes some time to actually understand why this problem can even be put in this framework, so that's not a, Yes, I think for Hirsch Pushub it's actually the same R. And I'm just going to assume that R is something very big because I'm going to use semi classical analysis, so I need a huge but finite number of derivatives and terms in my expansions to work. Okay. So, so here's the result as advertised. This picture copied from uh, the first slide. So, what I claim is under all these assumptions, I fix an epsilon, well, I always have to lose an epsilon. That's just, we have to make our peace with that. And then under this pinching condition, you have two resonance-free strips. So you have the spectral gap up to half the minimal expansion rate, and then from half of maximal expansion rate to the minimal expansion rate, that's not empty because, because of the pinching condition. And then in between the two, you can actually count resonances. And the counting, well, the power is related to the dimension of the trapped set. I'll mention the uh, section previous work a bit later. And the constant in this power, the, uh, the constant in this while law is just the symplectic volume of a naturally chosen chunk of the trapped set. Just remember that was a symplectic manifold, so it's, well, that's exactly what you would expect it to be in a way. That's, that's the volume that you should be taking. You have a l l logarithmic, so that's a non-trapping situation. You have no trapping. Right. 
Well, you get exponential decay of the corresponding right. solutions to the wave equation, but. Yes. Um, well, so for Morowitz, for Morowitz, say single obstacle, the situation is non-trapping, right. so uh, nothing of this appears. For two obstacles, you can actually get a single trap tray which is hyperbolic, and that's the work of Gerard Schostrand in a way, at least in the setting that I'm considering. And that would give you a single string of resonances, and that would actually be, uh, be directly related to this. If you have at least three obstacles, you become fractal. Right, so you don't have a model where you can do a No. Well, two obstacles, but that's a completely integrable model which has been studied before. So, so yeah, that's. Uh, e yeah, so these. Well, that, that is possible. I mean, the, the question is really whether you get this uh, very specific structure of the trapped set. And that I would have to, I have to admit, I, n I never looked at this kind of problem. So I, I, I don't know what kind of so trapping they entail. Is the main point this theorem just a kind of vile law, or is it the fact that you've got uh, just gaps? Both. Okay. You cannot get, well, I cannot get a vile law without gaps. Because. <laughs> Uh, well, so that's, of course, that's, that's not, I mean, people would love to see something like that for hyperbolic quotients, but no, well, I, I, I don't know, and I don't know anybody who knows, I think, how to do this. And one problem is because your resonances, they never end, so until which point do you count them? Here you have very nice bounds on your resolve and polynomial bounds above and below, and that lets you somehow squeeze it in between and really have control on your traces and so on. Yes. So actually this, uh, this problem reduces to something, if you know, a uh, damped wave equation. So that's uh, once you have this gap above and below, uh, somehow you expect that anything that would be true, well, and the microlocal analysis in between, actually anything that you expect to be true for the damped wave equation, you can get here. So that uh, becomes like a small, once you have a second gap, you can re re remove this crazy part below in a way. And, uh, problem becomes tangible. Okay. Okay, so here I'll uh, I'll just say two words. This is not a GR talk. Well, if you actually do this for exact curvature, you can actually compute these things and you can see that well for non-rotating black hole your expansion rates are the same everywhere and when it starts rotating, you can actually get <laughs> your trapped set kind of elongates and there is a part of it which is close to the event horizons and that produces a very slow decay rate so from A from, I guess, 0 0.05 or 0 0.06 something. That's numerics, but still, you can, uh, you, you're actually, you, your condition will be violated and you, you will have, most of the results will apply, but the bands will not be. Anyway, that's just a slide to show that you can actually calculate these things. Okay, so what's the previous work? Some previous work. So first of all, this part of the picture, the first, Interesting part is this gap, spectral gap. And that's the most robust fact. It's been established in much greater generality. You don't need smoothness, you don't need you know, uh, anything. Well, need something, but not as much. So that was proved by, in, in different settings by Gerard Schostrand and in this dynamical setting uh, by Dolgopiat, Liviarani, and Tsuji. And then uh, back to normally hyperbolic trapping, the usual Wunsch-Zworski, Nonemasher-Zworski. And the effective gap that you get in this case actually coincides with the size of the gap that we get. Now, <coughs> in terms of counting, there are numerous works on having an upper bound on the number of resonances in regions close to the real line. So in different settings, many of them having to deal with different kind of infinities. Uh, that was done by Shostrand. Gepelin Zworski, Nomasher Shostrand Zworski, Dachev, uh, Dachev and myself, and Dachev, myself, and Zworski. And the general bound is always the same. Namely, you want to say that the number of resonances here is bounded by constant times if this is H inverse 
H to the minus Hausdorff or actually upper Minkowski, by the way it's proved, the measure of the trap set divided by two. So our while law, in our case, the trap set has co-dimension two, so our while law actually saturates this upper bound. Okay. But the upper bound is valid in much more general situations. Then there are some cases where you know where resonance is lies, so you can recover some of the structure. That's the Jacques Schuster and Christensen for exactly a situation like two obstacles, a single hyperbolic trap trajectory. And then Saboretta's Worski and myself, that's the work for specific black holes, non-rotating and rotating ones. And finally, there are some rare cases where you can actually recover this band structure. It doesn't look like that exactly. The geometry in the complex is different. Say for Schuster's Worski, it would be cubic regions and so on. The setups would be different. So that's, uh, that was done by Shostra and Vodev and Shostra and Zvorsky. That's for elasticity and scattering by convex obstacles. Then there are works by Zvorsky and Shostra and which uh, establish while counting for some non-sulfide joint problems, which is a related question. And finally, there is this work of Fort Suji, which actually recovers these band structures for contact and also flows, again, under a pinching condition. So what happened is if you had a contact on also flow, say, generated by geodesic flow on a constant curvature manifold, you would actually see these precise strings of resonances coming in. The real resonances would just be the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. And then if you, even if you have variable curvature, if you have some arbitrary on also flow, Ford Suji actually show that this band structure will persist and they have counting. So the difference between these two works is that Ford Suji, they face some unique challenges coming from the fact that you cannot assume that the stable and stable decomposition is smooth. So there, somewhere in previous slide, I assume something is basically smooth. For them, it cannot even be C2. People proved if it's C2, it's... Well, the... Well, the, the method of proof is uh, very similar. So the applications are different, but the analysis inside actually has a significant overlap. So the, so the phenomenon. So the issue is they are looking at resonances of the system actually. And if they measure, you know, they got it, they got it. That is so, that, that it, it is quite surprising that this produces the same dynamical phenomenon inside, but Anyway, so I'll just, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have the time to explain how. That, that's a really exciting piece of work, but uh, both for Strostrand and this work. But then I should say, well, uh, why doesn't, say, their works, so that, that explains why my work doesn't supersede theirs, because I can't handle low regularity, but they have to pay a price for that, because they cannot recover information away from the trapped set. Somehow they conjugate by an escape function and they restrict to a very small neighborhood of the trapped set, which is somehow barely enough to make the counting argument work. So they recover nice things about counting, but if you want to know something that actually happens in space outside of the trapped set, then you have to assume more smoothness and then you have to do this other work that I do. Okay, so now how does the proof work? Well, so I'm going to erase all that. Well, where does this band structure come from? I claim that it actually comes from Taylor expansion. So why would you have a discrete number of levels of exponential decay? I only have one level, but really the, 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 it, they, they should go all the way. Well, consider this situation. Consider this unitary operator. That's a concept needed to, things need to make it unitary u of t f of x, say in 1D even, f of e to the minus t x, okay? Now the corresponding generator is what? It's x times partial x uh, plus, you know, i over 2 sub-principal terms. The corresponding symbol, so if we were to look at it microlocally, the corresponding symbol is x times psi, so the corresponding classical evolution and that's what you will get microlocally if you look at this group. What, what, what it does is a Fourier integral operator. That's just the Hamiltonian flow of x times psi. And we know what it looks like. Looks like that. 
So it's not just normal, it's the hyperbolic flow, the original hyperbolic flow. That's our trapped set. And now that's a situation similar to what I drew before. And then, well, what we want to do is we want to understand long-term behavior of waves, or we want to expand this as a sum of exponentially decaying modes. Well, we just need to tailor expand at zero. So what I can write here is u of t, f of x, is equal to e to the minus t over 2, f of 0, plus o large of e to the, well, minus 3t over 2. My research, I get e to the minus t, but that's not uh, as important. Right? That's what you get from just Taylor expanding in, you know, in some relevant norms in the compact set. Now, what I want to say is that if I have my more complicated situation, what I can do is I can still run this Taylor expansion argument. And for that, if I have my linear wave, I have to identify this first term. And so that's the key ingredient. So that's going to be our first term, which I will call pi f. And then you will have a remainder. So what I really want to say is for the wave propagation, e to the i t squared of delta f, it will be the usual, you know, the same wave propagation applied to pi f, which, has, which will have some nicer properties. You know how fast exactly this decays in time, plus O large of something nicer in time. So something exponentially decaying faster than you would think. Okay. So the first step would be identifying this pi, constructing it as a Fourier integral operator, and that's actually, that turns out to be technically the most demanding part, because in order to find the amplitude, this, the symbol of this operator, the full symbol, you actually need to invoke the global dynamics of the flow, and that's where our normal hyperbolicity, as just opposed to normal hyperbolicity, will come in. Then, the next step would be trying to understand how to prove a Taylor expansion. And I'll reach this in the end, hopefully. But the idea is you can prove Taylor expansion using uh, some very basic algebraic tools. So for example, for this remainder, you just know that u of t, f of x minus f of 0 is just e to the minus 3t over 2 g of e to the minus t over 2x where g of x is f of x minus f of 0 over x. That, that's, that's a silly way to prove Taylor's formula. You know that this function is smooth. And so then you just write it out like this. And then here you have your better rate of exponential decay. I should write x here. And then if we replace x by a suitably chosen suit differential operator, the proof still works. So those are these left-right annihilating ideals which are canonical algebraic slash microlocal objects associated to this pi. So that lets us reduce the Taylor expansion and with more work actually show the gaps. And the technical uh, that's done using positive commutator estimates today, I'll present it using wave propagation because it's intuitively nicer to understand. But uh, you know, if you actually want to prove stuff, wave propagation is kind of annoying. Uh, and then these remaining three tools, I don't have time to talk about them but they will actually deal with counting resonances. Once you have gap above and below, how do you count things in between? Well, you use complex analysis. Basically, use the argument principle. Now, in order to do that, you need to have two things. You need to find function whose zeros you're counting, and that's given by this Grushin problems, which reduces our problem to a Fredholm determinant. That's a somewhat commonplace thing. Yes, and moreover, it's trace class. Yeah, where, where does the operate? Well, so this is, well, what if happens? You, if you look at the symmetry, well, this would be highlighted the operator. So make, this is a highlight of the source. This operator is not trace. So that's why it's trace class. Well, so in fact, we just need the y a lot to a specific frequency, right? So what we need is we need to resolve our problem, modular compact or better a trace class operator in this region, but if you look at, so the elliptic estimates tell you that everything is invertible in this region of spectral values outside of a certain compact part of your phase space. And if you take an operator with a compact symbol, if you take a compactly supported symbol and you 
quantize it, you take the corresponding two differential operator, you get something compact and trace class and Hilbert Schmidt, so all of that. Uh, actually, the analysis will be the same because the analysis is on the trapped set. That would take me a while to explain because I haven't explained what the trapped set is in this case. But basically, it's something localized at functions which oscillate at frequency zero. But that's, uh, I, I am afraid I'll have to, uh, yes. Mm, well, that's not how it works technically, but yes. Yes, so, uh, yeah, you so. Yeah, but that doesn't give you a trace class thing. So you need to, you, you, you invert your problem everywhere but a compact region in phase space. And on a compact region, your functional analytical properties are somewhat trivial to establish once you have this. Okay, and in between, well, to actually calculate the integral for the argument principle, you need trace formulas, and that needs some additional things, but somehow less unexpected. If you want that similar surges for the damped wave equation. Okay, so how do we construct this? So we need some way to project onto the first band of residences. Well, even if you look at this operator, you take f of x, and you map it to f of zero, well, times the constant function one. That's not a differential operator anymore. It turns out to be a Fourier integral operator. So if you look how it moves around singularities or wave eight semi-classical wavefront sets in the cotangent space, so both in frequency and position, it transports them according to some canonical relation. For this specific case, you can see that the canonical relation is you take anything in this vertical line and you map it to anything in this horizontal line. That's a canonical relation. And that just corresponds to taking product with delta function, the integral against delta function, then multiplying by the constant function one which lives here. Of course, in our situation it's more complex, but uh, there is exactly one geometric object that could give you this. Namely, if I look back into my picture, say, of the gamma plus, of course, my geodesic flow is tangent to the trapped set, and that's really annoying because, well, it never reaches it. However, what you can do is you can take the symplectic complement of this thing, and that will be a one-dimensional distribution, tangent to gamma plus and transversal to the trapped set, and you can project along this. So you have natural projections from the incoming outgoing tails to the trapped set. They don't depend on the flow, actually. They just depend on the symplectic structure and, well, gamma plus minus. And then your canonical relation is just this. So what you will have is you have something that looks like this, but now you added more dimensions. So you have one point on gamma minus. It maps to a point on gamma plus, but you require that these projections are the same. And it turns out to be the right canonical relation. And then you can show that there exists unique non-trivial, okay, zero solves this, uh, unique non-trivial Fourier integral operator that microlocal linear the trapped set, so that's of course not exact equalities, that's all in terms of asymptotics or if you want the components of the full symbol, solves these two equations as idempotent and it commutes with your Laplacian, which is what you would expect for the spectral things. Okay, now, okay, how do you actually find this? How do you find a Fourier integral operator? Well, it's really something that's written as an oscillatory integral locally. For that you need a phase, but the phase just comes from the canonical relation or an old term, you know, the iconal equation and so on. So the phase, we already know it because we know what this canonical relation lambda is. But in order to solve for symbol, well, you need to look at the principal part of these equations and then, well, the sub-principal parts and so on. And so one of these problems issue with the sub-principal parts are, you know, they, 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 they're not done, you know, uh, yeah, they, they cause trouble. But anyway, so, well, we have two equations. This is a nonlinear equation, but it's algebraic. So what it actually tells you, if you look at the formula for product of a symbol of product of Fourier integral operators, it just tells you that the symbol, which lives on, say, this cross, is a product of something on gamma minus and on gamma plus, in a way. Now, so you reduce problem to finding things on gamma plus and gamma minus, and then the second equation, that's a commutation equation, it's linear, but it has a commutator, so what this reduces to is you have to solve a transport equation. 
So here, you have to solve a transport equation on this gamma plus, where luckily your right hand side is known to vanish on the trapped set. That you, you, you need to understand how to explain this, but it turns out to be true. And then you're looking for a function which also vanishes on the trapped set. Unfortunately, we are, our transport equation is along this flow which, is, uh, which never reaches the trapped set. So you still have a unique solution, but to find it, you need to integrate the right hand side along the whole trajectory. You will get an integral that's exponentially decaying because you had normal hyperbolicity and f vanishes on the trapped set. But the problem is, that's a unique solution, it's continuous, but it doesn't have to be smooth. Because when you differentiate this integral in the direction of the trapped set, you pick up the derivatives of the flow, which can grow exponentially. And that's where we need our normal hyperbolicity and an essential construction. And that's why you know, lower regularity cannot lead you, except for a specific case of hyperbolic quotients of uh, constant negative curvature, where I think some algebraic miracle happens, but it's a different question. So you need to know that your exponential decay rate will still kill your exponential growth so that you, you could get something smooth enough so that you could apply your microlocal analysis. Okay, well, now, okay, once you constructed your projector, how to proceed? As I said, you have to relate to the Taylor expansion. And you have to understand long term, it's until 4.15, right? I, I've been told at least. I, I mean, I can't stop now, but okay. J just checking, usually it's 50 minutes. So. Uh, so what you want to understand, hmm? <laughs> but might also have better things to do, I don't know. But <laughs> so you, you want to prove these two facts. You want to prove these two facts about linear waves. If I have a linear wave, if I apply my projector to it and then I look at local energy as I evolve along, you know, along the wave as, as I consider wave evolution of this thing, then I want this to have a controlled rate of exponential decay. And that corresponds to this uh, term, e to the minus t over 2 f of 0. Of course, well, that's the only dependence of t, so it does have a controlled rate of exponential decay. And by the way, nu min is here, nu max, and that's just one in this situation. Okay. And if I apply to the remainder, then I should have a rate of exponential decay that's faster. Okay, and by the way, I should note that u of t actually commutes with pi because we constructed it so that uh, our projector commutes with the Laplacian, so it commutes also with the wave propagation, which is a good property. Okay, and that actually, uh, that has nice applications to black holes because even if you don't have resonances, and you don't really have a resonance expansion here because of problems with null self adjoinedness of the problem, you can still derive interesting facts about long-term behavior of waves, at least up to log time and age. And then if you had this information, then you can get more or less easily your two gaps because if I had something, say, in this gap, well, it means I have a resonance state. So I have something like an eigenfunction which means that I will have a solution to the wave equation that will look like, well, something like that. And then when I plug it back into this formula, I see that the part corresponding to one minus pi decays too slowly because the part corresponding to one minus pi should really decay at this threshold. So you get h infinity. So you get one minus pi f v is all large of h infinity. So you can't have anything substantial there. So it means that your resonance state has to live on the image of this projector, which is actually a nice additional fact. It tells you it solves another dif pseudo differential equation. It tells you it reduces by one what you need to know about what, what, you, uh, what kind of freedom you have for if you want semi-classical defect measures of resonance states because it gives you some nice invariance along these lines. And so if you just had something on the image of pi, and you look at this fact and you again see that your rate of decay is, well, it's wedged in between the two, so your resonance, your resonance really has to lie here. Okay. Now, uh, so that's the model case that I already explained. So that's the Taylor expansion. Here's our generator. That's our projector, which is a Fourier integral operator. So incoming outgoing tails that I drew. 
And then how do you, well, how do you adapt the Taylor expansion proof to our situation? Well, so we had two facts, decay of the first term and decay of the remainder. So decay of the remainder, as promised, you just write it as f of xn minus f of 0 over xn is just xn times something. And this xn, that's a pseudo differential operator. It's a, differ it's a multiplication operator. When you propagate this operator along the wave group, it multiplies b to the minus t. So you have something of which is bounded, this part, multiplying by an operator whose norm decays very nicely. How do you establish things for the first term? Well, you have to use this, that your first term is actually constant in time, or it's, it's constant in x, right? It doesn't depend on x. So by, which means that if I want to take, say, a of x, times my propagated function, this expression, well, that's just my a, and this expression without the wave propagation only depends on the integral of a, right? Because this is, this is just a constant function. So here's. Okay. So then when I propagate my expression, my support of my quantum observable will be squished, so it will be like e to the minus t. And that's where the problem could come because your resonance state could vanish to very high power on the trapped set. And then you couldn't have any lower bound, but here it doesn't. You know it li it's like a constant, so you have precise control and you just need to understand the integral of the propagated thing, which you can. And then finally, well, for the general case, See, you have these two operators in red and some microlocal properties that we use. And you just need to replace them in a general situation by two pseudo differential operators which solve these equations. Because Xn annihilates your projector to one side and differentiation to the other side. And uh, well, that's pretty much it. And here, of course, this is phi is canonically defined. These solutions are not canonically defined, but as ideals they are. So if you propagate along your wave group, you will still have the same ideal of solution. So you have the structure that you can travel with and somehow attach yourself to your uh, Taylor expansion. Anyway, so uh, thank you for your attention and I'll pause it on uh, open problems. <laughs>